So my name is Jameson, but you can call me Jamie. Uh, I came here today from Buffalo, New York, which is the home of bad sports. Um, so thank you for having me in New York City, um, and thank you for Alter Count for having me for my first talk. So. Uh, <laughs> thanks. I'm representing Agorless, my company. Um, we are a tech startup who does uh, data analysis for indoor farming, and most of them are here today, so say hi, thank you. <laughs> and you can follow me on Twitter at Jamie Bash. So I'm going to talk about microaggressions. Well, what is a microaggression? Ash talked about this a little at the beginning, which was great. Um, I think it's a scary word that when people see it, they think they're going to get accused of being intolerant, and they don't think they're intolerant, so they don't want to talk about it at all. But a microaggression to me is something that, like, if it happened to you one time in your life, you would be like, wow, that was like a really annoying thing that happened, and then you would move on. But it happens over and over and over, and the more times it happens, the more hurtful it becomes. So I think every marginalized group has its own set of microaggressions. I'm going to talk specifically about um, ones in the trans community. And I've broken them down into like three categories. It's not comprehensive, but I've noticed things that I think are related, so I'm going to talk about them in that way. Um, I think the first thing you have to do is be aware of them, and then you can avoid them. And then after I talk about that, I'm going to talk about how to deal with them too. So number one is treating people like resources. What does that mean? I think that in the general community, maybe a lot of people don't know a lot about what it means to be trans. And there's this per perception that trans people know more about it, which is true. So um, it might seem harmless to ask them a lot of questions about what that's like because you want to learn. But the problem is that it's not really a trans people's job to be educators all the time. Um, a lot of people like to do advocacy and education. I do, and I think that's pretty great. Um, I'll do an educational sidebar. I'm Jamie. Uh, I am genderqueer or non-binary. Either term is fine. Um, that means three things. It means I don't identify as a man or a woman. It means I use... Number two, it means I use neutral pronouns they. I also use he personally, so either is fine. And number three, it means um, that I have really great hair. <laughs> you can go on Twitter and say that Jamie used stereotypes in their talk. That's fine, because I stand by the great hair stereotype. <laughs> but the problem is that when you have to do this over and over and you have to do it on demand, it can be really tiring. And it can make you feel like you have to justify your identity to everyone you meet in order for them to accept you. Um, sometimes if I don't feel up to educating uh, I'll hear people say things like, well, if you don't teach me about this, how am I going to learn about it? Uh, there, there's this website called Google that you can look things up on. So if you don't know something, try to educate yourself. If you're an ally, try to educate other people so the burden doesn't fall completely onto your trans friends. And if you still feel like you have a question that you need to ask a trans person, make sure it's someone you know and that they're comfortable answering your questions. Uh, when it comes to questions, there's a whole other set of problems because I think a lot of people will meet someone, find out they're trans, and then feel like they have a right to ask them like really personal questions <laughs> that they wouldn't have asked before, which is really bizarre to me. Um, so like, don't ask someone about their birth name. Like, they don't want you to know it. That's why they changed it. <laughs> uh, don't ask someone about their coming out story. That's like really personal, and for a lot of people, it's not like a sunshine and rainbow story. So like, if you met someone new, you wouldn't immediately ask them like, "Well, how did you feel after your mom died?" Like that would be really personal and rude. Um, for the love of God, please don't ask people about their genitalia. <laughs> you wouldn't ask that to anyone. Why would you do that? It's so rude. Oh my goodness. <laughs> um, the bottom line of this is that like trans people are actual people. They're not encyclopedias of gender theory. Number two, making assumptions. I think um, we all know it happens when you make assumptions. And since we all probably know what assumptions are, I'm going to go right into some ones that you should try not to make. Don't assume that everyone you meet is straight and cisgender. Uh, not only is that exclusive to people and excludes them, but it also reinforces this idea that that's like the normal thing to be and that other people are weird. Um, why would you ask if someone has a boyfriend or a girlfriend when they have perfectly good gender-neutral terms to describe that? Why would you start a talk by saying ladies and gentlemen if you have no idea if that uh, includes everyone in your audience? Speaking of this, 
Um, don't assume that there are only two genders, uh, and then act accordingly. When you have to do things every day and like choose male or female in a form or bathrooms and neither of those choices represent you, it's again really tiring. Um, from a tech perspective, a really big one is like online forms with drop downs that have two choices. Um, not only is that the, not inclusive, but you're also like excluding users from your base because like if I try to sign up for a website and it has two genders, I just like, okay, I didn't really need to be on this website that much. And so like it's bad business. On the, on the other side of this, making really small changes can make a really big difference to people. Um, adding a third gender option will take you two seconds, I promise, and there's no reason not to do it. And like, I'm gonna tell a story. When I started at my company, we, uh, our, our payroll software only had two options, and I mentioned this to my boss, which was really nerve-wracking because I had this on my first day. And not only did she say, oh, well, I don't think that's right, which made me feel good, but she said, I'm going to call our payroll company and tell them that they should change that, which made me feel like, oh, this is a really safe place for me to work. So that was good. Uh, don't assume somebody's pronouns. This is a really hot ticket item in the trans community. And the reason why is because respecting or not respecting someone's pronouns says a lot about if you respect them or don't respect them as a person. If you ask someone what their pronouns are, you're showing that you care about their identity. And if you make a safe space for us to ask each other's pronouns, like you do that by not getting offended if someone asks your pronouns, essentially. Like even if you feel like it's obvious, it's better to ask than to assume. Um, and then if you know someone's pronouns, you have to respect them. That's like more of a macroaggression if you don't. Um, not respecting pronouns can look a few different ways. Like consistently getting it wrong, um, complaining that it's hard all the time is like not good either. And then some people will even just tell me like, I'm not going to do that. Just refuse to try, which is crazy. Like I think, oh, well, th that's just a story people tell. But like I've even had friends that say singular they is not grammatically correct. So I'm not going to do it. And it's like, well, A, you're wrong. Like it is correct. <laughs> but B, even if you were right, like you're telling me that you care more about grammar than my feelings. So that's a hard thing to say to someone. Uh, bonus pro tip, if you get someone's pronouns wrong, which is a thing that happens, correct yourself, apologize, and then just move on. Like, Don't apologize over and over and draw more attention to it, because that's not helpful either. Just try harder next time. Uh, number three, tone policing and redirection. This is a little bit more of a complex one, but essentially is about not being willing to listen to marginalized people when they have things they want to say. Uh, it turns out that being marginalized is like, it sucks and is lame. So when people, the marginalized people often feel angry or scared or offended or any other number of negative emotions. It's not because we woke up one morning and decided like, I'm gonna be really difficult. It's because we've had like bad experiences and it affects how we, how we act and how we feel. Um, tone policing can look a few different ways, like you're being overly sensitive, you're being too dramatic, uh, you're, you're, you're demanding too much on people, you can't expect everyone to dot dot dot, and then the next part of that one is normally some basic re human respect thing, so it's like you can't expect people to just respect you. Or my favorite one is... Uh, you're alienating your potential allies. <laughs> if, if you want to revoke your respect for me because I don't behave a certain way that you decided is appropriate always, um, you weren't really a very good ally to begin with. So um, minimizing our struggles can be really condescending and then trying to demand that we express all of our anger in like sanitized ways that doesn't offend the society that has oppressed us, it's pretty infuriating. <laughs> Um, redirection, I guess, um, is the tendency to like take a conversation that's not about you and then redirect it so like it still is about you at the end. <laughs> um, I think this has been a really big problem since like the last few weeks since the election, so I think this is like an important one to talk about right now. Um, it often comes in the form of marginalized people that are trying to express their anger and then privileged people will get upset about it either because um, they feel called out, in which case you might hear slogans like, not all men, or um, 
because they feel like they should be included, in which case you'll hear slogans like, all lives matter. These were originally in like a really scary font um, because they're crappy things to say, but the font didn't show up, so. <laughs> uh, essentially, this is coming back to the idea, it's an unwillingness to listen to people and also like a weird need to dominate conversations by focusing on how it makes them feel, which is perceived as more important than how it makes marginalized people feel. I think this is the same mindset that gives us this really weird perception that calling someone a racist is like more offensive than like being a racist, which I've seen lately. Uh, and unfortunately, it's not just privileged people who can play this game. Marginalized people do this to each other all the time too. Um, I think it's because we're so invested in talking about our own struggles that we tend to co-opt conversations that should be about other people's struggles. Um, at worst, this ends up being kind of a competition of suffering, which I call the oppression Olympics, and it's not really helpful. Um, it can be particularly hard to deal with when it's minorities that are rejecting methods of inclusiveness that are meant for other minorities because I feel like they should be on my side. Just as an example, so you know what I mean, I've met trans women who are against gender neutral bathrooms and things like using the gender neutral honorific on forms because they it doesn't represent them and it's affirming to them to use the female options, which I get, but then when they say that, they're not thinking of someone like me who doesn't have an option that's affirming for me. Intersectionality is like way too much to talk about right now. It's like a hundred more talks after this, but it essentially means that inequalities are connected to each other and in this situation, it looks like being able to say, this conversation isn't about me, and that's okay. But maybe you already knew all of this stuff that I just said, and maybe you're like me and you have to deal with it all the time, and it makes you you know, feel really sad or not want to go out. And if that's true, I'm really sorry. So this is what I would like you to take away. Letting go of guilt and letting go of the idea that taking care of yourself is a selfish act. Um, First off, if somebody is a jerk to you, or uh, doesn't respect you, or misgenders you, or anything like that, it's not your fault. That's something that reflects on them, and not on you. <laughs> you you're, you're awesome. Um, these are just coping mechanisms. I'm not trying to like victim blame anyone for this happening to them. Um, don't feel guilty about asking people to respect you. You deserve to be respected, like at all times. You deserve to be respected when you are upset or angry. You deserve to be respected no matter what you're wearing. You deserve to be respected no matter who you're with. Uh, don't feel guilty for correcting people's pronouns over and over and over if they keep getting it wrong. Don't feel guilty for not correcting them if you don't feel up to it. If you like aren't in a place where you feel safe enough to have that conversation, you're not like less trans because you let people get it wrong. Here's a secret. People feel guilty about like the dumbest things. Like, I'll feel guilty when I wake up and I had a dream where someone called me by my birth name in my dream. But you don't have to justify yourself or answer to these expectations that people have of you. You know, you don't have to look a certain way or dress a certain way or be the model of masculinity or femininity in order for your identity to be valid. You should do what feels right to you. Because taking care of yourself is your most important job. It's not selfish, it's like a necessary thing you have to do in your life. Because if you're not taking care of yourself, you can't do anything else that you would normally be doing as well as if you were taking care of yourself. You have to give yourself permission to like actually experience your emotions, even the negative ones. You have to give yourself permission to surround yourself with positive people in your life that like care about you. And you don't have to feel guilty for not wanting to engage with negative, toxic people. You deserve to feel safe uh, with the groups that you associate with. So basically, it's okay to transition at your own pace. It's okay to stand up for yourself. It's okay to feel hurt when people do say hurtful things to you. But in the end, I hope that you won't define yourself by these microaggressions because you're more than that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>